Okay. So, so today we are completing, let's say, the the part about designing things. So we started with design principle, theories, guidelines, and uh, you have seen patterns. Uh, and now let's see another aspect of designing things. Um, and then tomorrow you will move to the heuristic evaluation part for three lectures, including lectures and exercise, all about the heuristic evaluation that will be your individual assignment, assignment five. But before moving there, so before changing the topic and going to the evaluation part, let's complete the design part. And in particular, let's consider another aspect of designing. And so overall, in general, we spoke about um, design in general. Hmm? We never focus too much on people capabilities. We said, yes, we, we should consider different target population, different target user. We have the extreme user, the expert user, the immediate users, but there were a subset of sort of general population. And we sometimes said, okay, children and the elderly, but we never went into more detail than that. Hmm? So what we should know up to now is more or less what are, is reported in these slides. So we should know, we should be convinced up to now that it's important to design for people and to follow a human-centered process. And we also know that we should know or we should have uh, understood up to now that people are a mess, um, meaning that they have different abilities, different weaknesses. They can come from different background, different culture. They can have different interests, viewpoint, experience. They can have different ages. They can have different attitude. They have different opinions. They have different wants and that are not the needs that they have, etc. And they are also not always reliable because we, we already mentioned this, but if you are doing something for, let's say, a, a user interface for uh, booking an exam at Politecnico, and you do this, this, a person is using that interface in a quiet room, is very different than using the same interface in a, quiet, in a very noisy environment. And the interface is the same, but you should in some way adapt and consider this different context in which it happens. Uh, so all these things, hmm, these things reported in the slides, the things about the context, the time of the day, the, the period of life in which you are, has an impact clearly on how a person uses a software application interactive system, and in some cases on whether they can use it at all. Hmm? So not only um, the impact on how you use it, but also whether you can or not can use it. And, and what we typically do is that we, in the room, we typically do is designing for, for us, for ourselves. So designing for people like us. When you make a decision decision, the first point is your, clearly it is your perspective. Maybe you learn something from your user in some need finding, et cetera, but you start from your opinion, right? You, you cannot really start on other people's opinions. Say, okay, I need to put this button here, this layout this way, because it's, it's better, because it's follow some principle, because, but it's, it's, you start from yourself. And we, as people, typically do that if we don't think about it. Um, and especially we start, and this is the part we never um, analyze a lot during the past lecture, the part about our abilities. And so we tend to use our abilities as a starting point. We see, more or less correctly, some of us as eyeglasses, but we 
typically with eyeglasses we see correctly, more or less. We probably see colors for a good variety of colors. We can, in this room at least, we can all use a keyboard, a mouse, a touch screen. We use computers, tablet, iPad, iPhone, whatever, smartphone, etc. So we tend to use our abilities as starting point, our context as starting point. And these things that we do is making things for people like us easier, but can make things different for others that are not like us. And so we end up with system design for people like us. And people like us means specific gender, specific age, specific language ability, tech literacy, physical ability, access to money, resources, time, etc. So it's not only being in this room in Italy, but also around a few assumptions that we bring with us. And we should make an effort instead to think that this is not the only context possible, not even for us. Hmm? So what we are going to cover today is trying to think who is, let's say, normal, which is the traditional user, which is the typical user, and to say that probably there is no normal user, traditional user overall an entire life. So we design technology that depends heavily on what, on our senses, on what we can see, what we can hear, what we can say, and what we can touch, mostly. And again, we assume that all these senses and abilities are fully operational, fully enabled all the time. And if we do this assumption, that again, for some people like us, in, say, in some moments in the life, is true. But for others, or for ourselves in other moments of life, means ignoring several people. And we don't want to ignore these people. We want to follow, continues to follow a, a human-centered process and to consider humans uh, at the beginning, always. So what I, I'm saying is, for instance, let's, let's use this picture as an, as, as an example. So you can have a permanent loss of touch. That is, you are with a disability and you are not able to use, let's say, one arm. So if you design something that requires you to use both hands, you are excluding these people. Okay, so let's say that these people are 1% of the population. Still a big number, not 99%. So it doesn't, may seem not a big loss. But then what happens if we look at the temporary or situational aspects? So yes, we can have, if we require a system to use both ends, we can have, we can exclude people with one arm. One arm. Uh, but we can also exclude people in a temporary situation. You broke your arm. So for that moment, for that week, those weeks, those months, you are not able to use both of your arms, both of your hands, because one is blocked. So if, again, the system is require you to use both hands, both arms, you are excluding people in temporary situation. That could, can also be, let's hope not, but it could also be something like us. It happens. To, broke, to, to break uh, an arm. And also, we can have situational, contextual moments. So it's not temporary. Yes, it's, it is temporary, but not only. It's not like br breaking an arm. It's like uh, a new parent that cannot use an arm in that moment because it has a child with him or with her. So it's situational. Then at a certain point, the child will grow up, will sleep, and, and the harm is, is still free hmm, to do. But in that specific moment, hmm, the system that assumed to use, let's say, both arms, both hands, is excluding all these people in a permanent, temporary, or situational condition. Hmm? 
And we can think about everything else in the other senses. So for seeing, if we need a full sight, we are not only, and our application doesn't work if you don't see everything, you are not only excluding blind people, but you're also excluding people with a cataract. That is temporary because typically you go under medical procedure and you uh, got back your, your view, your sight seat. But also, if your system is instead in a, in a car, relying exclusively on sight, it makes the system inappropriate or difficult to use while driving. And so adding other senses, other, other opportunities could help not only the driver, but also all the other people. And same things for hearing. If you rely exclusively on audio, you yes, you're excluding people who are deaf, you are excluding people with hair uh, infection, but also you're excluding people in a crowded place, in noisy place, because they cannot hear in that moment. So according to the context, to the situation, to the stage of life, you risk, if you rely exclusively on one of these, to exclude some people. And this uh, quantity of people could be as large as we want if we consider permanent, temporary, or situational uh, possibilities. So how we can incorporate these aspects in our design? Uh, we can incorporate these aspects with two, let's say, set of principal methodologies. One is called inclusive design, and the other one is universal design. And they are sort of similar, but not identical. Uh, so inclusive design, sometimes they're used with, with, in the same term uh, in, in exchange, but here we use a definition uh, from Microsoft design, actually for inclusive design, Let's say that inclusive design is different from universal design. And inclusive design is a design methodology that is totally compatible with what we are doing now in the course, but it enables you to and draw on the full range of human diversity. So including all these permanent, temporary, and situational aspects. Uh, and it's uh, what is called a uh, one size fits one methodology. Different from universal design that instead is one size fits all. Hmm? That means that with inclusive design, you want to design a system or a portion of a system hmm? for a specific use case and then extending these to others. So we, again, we are relying on the definition of Microsoft. Let's say that for inclusive design, you have to consider three principles. First of all, recognize exclusion. Recognize that your application can exclude somebody in some sense, in some moments. Hmm? So examine what you do, what you are doing, what you did, and think about is this feature, is this set of features that I have, is this user interface, usable by everybody, or I can exclude somebody in some, again, permanent, temporary, or situational um, uh, context. And then, if we identify that, we, well, should put people at the center of the design process from day zero, and that is something that we already have, have said. And you can try to imagine, or you can try to speak with people the one that you think you're excluding, and try to imagine how they will use the system. Hmm? We cannot clearly imagine all the context, all the situational, but one step at a time, we can adapt, we can extend our system or application. And then try to solve for one, that is the third principle, and try to extend this to many. Thinking, okay, I'm solving this for people who are blind, but can this be extended to others, hmm? et cetera. So these are the three principles, and 
one way to focus on this principle or applying on this principle is start thinking of the, let's say, hardest constraint that you can have, like excluding, like the permanent situation, like excluding one sense totally. So, for instance, designing for people with permanent disability. So, let's make an example. Think about it. Um, let's say that you want to design something for people that are hard of hearing. What you can design, or better, what it was created originally for people hard of hearing that we are now using, also we are using, not in this moment, but we are typically using. Subtitle, captions. Caption where? In captioning where caption? In, for instance, let's make a practical example of caption that you use. In films or, yes, in films. or on YouTube. Hmm? So, this, think about caption uh, that was created for art of hearing, but then can be useful for read in crowded situation, or if you don't want to make noise to uh, another person, or if you're in a class and you're watching a video instead of, of listening to the professor. It's all cases in which you can use this technology that was made for a specific particular, a specific category of people and then extended to others, and now we use them. We have them on YouTube. It's an option. It's not even complex to activate them. It's just one click and then setting the language most of the time. But it's, it's easy to use it, and it's something that is pre present in television, on, on YouTube, on uh, Computers, it's pervasive, it's not something very, very niche. But it started for people hard of hearing. Mm -hmm. And it was also used to teach children how to read. And also, if you want to learn a language, one way to learn the pronunciation is actually to listen to you know, movies or whatever in the original language, and you can use caption to help recognizing the sound and matching the sound with the word. So it's, it's something that started with a very specific population in mind, and then it was expand, expanded. And also the other three things actually were created from specific population. Remote controls. Remote controls that are in every house, basically, to turn on the TV, started for people with disability. They cannot go to, to the television and turn on or the elderly, they cannot move easily. But then we use them. Even if we can walk until the television and press some buttons. And some television doesn't have even buttons anymore because you have the remote control. Or automatic door openers. You, if you are able to push a door or press an handle to open the door, you don't need the automatic door Opening, openers, but if you cannot, you have technology that helps you. And again, this was started with specific people and then it's spread everywhere and we also benefit of that, even we, if we are able to open a door, if we want. And same things for the audiobooks. Also audiobooks started for people who have issue with sight and then they are commercial and everybody can use audiobooks and use audiobooks. So all these, are, were actually created with some constraint in mind and then extended. Uh, so let's make an example. So let's make an example now. Let's create this. I, I know where I want to, to go, but let's, let's assume this. So let's say that we are together creating a video game for console, like PlayStation 3 or Xbox, so not for computers. And we want to do a competitive game where we have a charter that jump, run, and we drive also some cars or something at a certain stage. So it's a competitive. And you have to do action, so it's action-based, you have to do some actions, and it's also competitive, so it's not 
doing it at your pace, but you want to, to earn point versus another person. We create a video game, very engaging, very fun, with 11 levels, whatever, competitive, with a console, so with the joystick, whatever, and we are able to, to run it, to execute it, so people can use the joystick to run, jump, drive, whatever they want to do. Who are we excluding? Blind people. Then? Let's say that we are very, very good and we target all the consoles. People with some motor disabilities. Uh, let's uh, also think not just the edge cases. These are the edge cases, right? The, the, the co most, most constrained one. Uh, or, so let's say that we have this console. We also bought the console and give people the console because we are millionaires. And we can create the game and also give the console to the people. So, perfect. Uh, so, who are we excluding? If we give a console like this to someone, Let's, we can continue with the edge cases, but. I'm asking you which are the middle cases. <laughs> so the, the temporary or situational, for instance, uh, or related to a specific game condition. We are excluding novices player, yes. Yes, novices meaning not expert. So people that start using the game or the console for the first time. So we are, you know, and then, okay, um, about edge cases, we mentioned um, physical disabilities and sight disabilities, right seeing, and then which other edge cases we can think about. Yes, the, let's say disabilities are in the mental area, yeah. like cerebral palsy or these other kind of disabilities. They're not visible disabilities, like I, I cannot use an arm or I don't see, and so I have a cane to move around, but also invisible, let's say, disabilities like uh, problems in the mental area or behavioral areas. Okay, now. How we can solve this? What we can do in our game on the console to include, uh, let's say, at least one of this category? We can add audio description to, to the game and to the action that the person needs to do. So now jump. Right, but this is also competitive. Yes, this is also competitive. So we should be careful because if the description say press whatever to jump and the person needs to wait to press whatever to jump, maybe the games go go on and you. So yes, absolutely. It depends on the game, but you should be careful balancing the description at the right moment. Otherwise, you are slowing down the game, and so it's not competitive anymore. You're you will, will never win because you are introducing slowness in the game. But that is one thing that we can do, and that will benefit also if we want other people. Hmm? Again, think about being in a dark room or uh, with problems with illumination or just with cataract, etc. and this could be helpful also for, for gaming. Well, I mean, not people with cataract don't play a lot of games, but uh, let's say that similar things. Then. The voice control, yes, is, is the counterpart of what he was saying. Hold your description, voice control. Can be, then? We can edit the, let's say, the hardware, or we can command the hardware differently. Mm, 
maybe not. I mean, yes, you can technically, but it's, it's not the goal, right? Um, you don't want really to, to say, okay, you are less able, so you have to play with the other less able like you, and you are good, so you're, you're playing with a good one. If you want to avoid exclusion, this is actually <laughs> the wrong way to do that. <laughs> okay, but I think that these are um, good things, and, and we cover this, the factor to consider. So what if you have limited mobilities, and what if you never played a video game before? So this is actually a factor to consider. You know, play the video game before is not an edge case, it's something that clearly can happen at various stage to. So one possi possible solution uh, that is in addition to, to yours is can be a co-pilot mode. Hmm? Meaning I can allow two game controller to work together. Hmm? So that you can have an advanced player and a less advanced player that playing together and one is helping the other see with some mechanism so it changed the mechanic of the game a little bit. But instead of having one user that competes with another user, you have two users, a copilot that help him. So this is good for people with fine motor disabilities because there is another person that help. Without, include, without slowing down the game with voice or with audio, because this other person is expert, so it can, it can play. Or also this also apply with not advanced skills. People, people with not advanced skills that can learn by, they can delegate some activities that are more difficult to another person and still see what happens and learn how to, super, how to, to go after a level, a stage of the game. Hmm? And this open, just this idea of copilot opens gaming to various kinds of people. So people with disabilities or temporary injuries, novice gamers that we said, kids, Maybe you have an adult and the kids playing the game and the adult take control on some parts and the kids can do other parts that's easier or more appropriate for their age. Or also people who want to play together without competing. Because in that moment it's the couple that compete. But inside the couple they can play together freely without competition. <coughs> so it's not a, this one is not an edge case is not situational, it's not a constraint, it's just recognizing that there are people that don't love competition. And they love more cooperative games. And so they can play in this way. The same games that was born as competitive one. Okay, is the solution convincing enough to you? I'm not invented that. Actually, Microsoft invented that. This is the co-pilot mode of the Xbox One. So the Xbox One has actually this modality enabled for this reason. So they use, they say to use this inclusive design process for them and asking the same, who are we excluding? And they did basically a longer version of the, of the example that we did in the room to come up with these and other solutions. So this is an option that the Xbox One has, that is the copilot mode that works as we, we say. And then at this point, according to the inclusive design, we should ask, who are we excluding now? So we added this copilot mode, we benefit all these people, who are we excluding? Well, let's say that this copilot could work also on remotely, so you can have, you don't need to be in the same room, let's imagine that, but who are we excluding? Yes, people that cannot use this. Uh, we said before that yes, you need um, fine motor skill to compete. Well, maybe you, if you don't have fine motor skills, you maybe have also trouble to using this, to pressing the button very, very precisely. And so, extending, okay, reiterating again, Microsoft created it's not advertised to Microsoft, it's just that they, do, they did something very, very, very nice, very, very well done. So following uh, on that stage, it's the Xbox Adaptive Controller that is an 
a series of controllers that maps the same buttons, the same indicators that you have on the joypad, but in a different format, in a different way. Hmm? So you basically connect this one hmm, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the console, and you can use this instead of the joypad, hmm? and which is the advantage. And then you can also have, you can plug in other things hmm, to this, so map. Not only this is like, this is the control and then you can map other object to the single option according to your needs. Hmm? So for instance, these are, what are these two things here? They are buttons. They are two different uh, size of buttons that you can press. Hmm? So if you don't have fine control and you cannot press the A button on the, on the joypad, you can maybe press this one that is like 10 centimeter. And you can press it in many ways. You can press it with your arm, you can press it with your hand, with the palm of your hand, you can press it with your head according to your motor skill. And also there are other things that you can, you can touch, but the point is they started with the status quo, the joypad and games, and they asking themselves, who are we excluding? And copilot mode was one way to solve some exclusion and then extend it to others, kids, for instance. And then they ask again, who are we excluding now? Well, people that cannot use the, that controller. And so it's not, wasn't a software problem anymore in this case, but it was, became an hardware problem. So they created another controller that is more flexible and you can attach what you need to, you, to control a computer. Hmm? Because there are people, like people with cerebral palsy, that are a minority, but still they are, that cannot use a keyboard or a mouse. They cannot, double, they cannot even double click this. You cannot rely on the capability of clicking twice, even this large button within a certain time, that is the double click. Hmm? They will push it, and at a certain time they will release it. So it will be just one and zero, pressed, not pressed. And that is the only way to interact for them to a computer. So very, very limited as input device. But with these kind of things, clearly if the game is too complex, there is other problem. Typically, typically general cerebral palsy also brings um, cognitive issues, not just cognitive problems, not just motor problems. So if the game is too complex, they cannot play it in any case, but maybe with the co-pilot they can, with a, with a friend, with a brother, a sister, a parent, etc. And without excluding them, without saying okay, you cannot play with the, with the console, you have to play with your simplest game. Not like everybody, every other your, of your friends that instead are playing with whatever game is currently popular. Hmm? So this is also about not excluding in that sense people. Hmm? So this is an, an example, a practical example of inclusion design because actually Microsoft adopted this, and this is something you can buy. It's not something for research, it's actually a product. Hmm? And also the copilot is actually a feature of the console, okay? So this is inclusion design. So asking yourself, which are we excluding now in that moment? One size fits one, hmm? one changes. Hmm? They are not making the, the console working for everybody in the world immediately. But there's focusing one edge cases, in a sense. Hmm? So one question that typically arises at this point, or can typically arise at this point, is are we speaking about accessibility? Because we speak about people with disabilities. Um, and the answer is not only. 
uh, because accessibility, as is written here, is an attribute. Design inclusive design is a method. So, and then accessibility focus primarily on people with disabilities, ensuring that there are no barriers to serve them, to allowing them accomplish their goal, their task. In whatever kind of intervention accommodation you can have, software, hardware, physical, immaterial, cognitive, whatever. Inclusive design, vice versa, makes your system and your products in the end has the potential to make the system and the product more accessible, but it's not a methodology to check if something is accessible. Because accessible has some standards. We have seen the guidelines about accessibility. These are the web standards for accessibility. Guidelines for checking if a website or web application is accessible or not. It's a guideline. You can check the boxes in that case. And here you don't have boxes to check. You have to think about it and try to design something in that sense. Hmm? So they can work together, inclusive design accessibility, but they are not the same things. Hmm? One can ensure or improve the other. And this is inclusive design. Uh, the other methodology that I would like to, to mention is a little bit older than inclusive design. And it's also a little bit more popular and sometimes, as I was saying, they, use, they are using the same term. So inclusive design, universal design, exchangeably. Uh, we just did separate that. So universal design instead is a one size fits all approach. So an approach that don't try to consider specific cases, but say how we can make something usable for everybody, universal. Hmm? And it start, it's born in the physical world. We have so many examples of universal design in our streets and our buildings, and then was adopted in the digital world, but it starts in the physical world. And typically it does not involve participation of people, of excluding communities, excluding people. It's just a set of principle that you can apply. And universal design has seven principles that are principles, again, like the one that we have seen. And some of them are actually not so different from the one that we have already mentioned, so like about something about errors, for instance. Hmm? So we have said recover from errors. It is tolerance of errors. Hmm? Or simple and intuitive use. Hmm? So some of them are really not so different from the principle that we have we already seen. In some cases, they are more focused. Hmm? Like size and space for approach and use. And here you see why they were built, they were born in the physical world. Because size and space. Hmm? So this is, in the picture, an example is, this is made with the right size and space so that it doesn't matter if you are on a wheelchair or whatever, you can still use that. So here you can see the difference between inclusive design and universal design. Universal design tried to design something that can be used by everybody. It's not asking I design one thing and then how can improve it? Who are we excluding? It starts from the point to say I don't want to exclude nobody. So you should design things that are usable for everybody, no matter who, no matter their abilities. So this works incredibly well in the physical world, not always in the digital world, but it's a goal, an objective to have, design universally. Uh, so this is a clear example, and also this is an example. And so she source that can be used independently if you are right or left, using the primary hand is the right or the left hand. It's the same object, it's not another object. It's not she source for some people and another kind of she source for other people. Or equitable use, the automatic doors. 
that doesn't matter if it's, again, you are a wheelchair, you are not, you have, uh, you're carrying around a child, so situational, uh, let's say, abilities, constraint on your abilities, because you are carrying a child, so you don't have your hands free to open doors, or you're just uh, tired or lazy, you don't want to open the door. There is automatic doors that hopefully opens for you. So these are all examples, and again, you see, they are from the physical world about universal design. So equitable use, flexibility, simple and intuitive, perceptible information, tolerance for error, or low physical effort is another thing that is close to the physical world, the low physical effort. So no matter which is your strength, you should be open to press this. No matter if you are a child with, or an elderly or uh, very, very, with a lot of strength, you still need to be able, in some cases, to open this door. And it's the same object for everybody. It's not another object, like, again, inclusive design. So just a few examples. Um, what is this? Mm -hmm. it's, 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 yes, it's part of the sidewalk, and this is for this part. Yes, it's, it's typically, we, we associate for people with wheelchair, because there is no, uh, it's, it's easier to, to go up, and again, if you have a suitcase, or if you are carrying around a child, this is something that still you will find useful because you don't have to jump onto the, the sidewalk. And lines? There are lines. They are not aesthetics. They have a meaning. These lines here. For blind They're for blind people. Why? For the cane, yes. They have the stick of the cane, yes. Because blind people can should recognize that the street is changing, is moving up. And so this is telling them that there is something that's changed. It's not the street anymore, but it's a sidewalk. And so you can recognize, and you can also recognize the, the, the shape of that. Because at a certain point, this ends and becomes the, the sidewalk, the normal sidewalk. So also this is not the same so here you cannot, you don't go up anymore, you just finish this, this part. So this is, so people with motor disabilities, people with objects to carry around, people with, uh, who are blind, is this universal or inclusive design? It's inclusive or universal? You say inclusive. We said that inclusive design is one fit size, one size fits one. And it's think about the Xbox is adding the copilot, adding another controller for serving a specific population. And universal instead is universal. It's building something that is usable immediately for everybody without excluding nobody. So this is more universal, because this is usable by everybody, no matter if you are young, older, on a wheelchair or not. And also in some situational issue, condition, you can use it. It's there, available to use. And also for people who are blind, they can use it with a cane to understand the shape of the street. Um, this is another example that I can try to open. Yes, give modification. This is old, and 10 years ago, so it's quite old. Um, what happens? Do you see what happens? Okay, it's in Italian, but.
What do you do in this, this user interface? Look from here, you see it? The selection changes. So this is, this is a night tracker we mentioned last time, to, to last week, very, very briefly, when we spoke about visual design. And this is a night tracker, this is an old night tracker. This 10 years old night tracker. Um, so these here and on the top are a series of infrared cameras that after training uh, with a specific person in front of it that needs to stay in the same position. This person cannot leave and then come back without doing the training again most of the time. Can track the pupil. And so the system recognizes where you are seeing, fixating the screen. So in this case, this was about a room, a house. You have seen the, the, the shutter that was opening, closing. So here it's selected whatever room it is, and then it's selected another room, and then it probably select a button that, say, that goes in the room, and the kitchen in this case, and then and then there is lowering down, controlling the, the physical environment in this case. But so, is this more inclusive or universal with the information I give to you? It's more inclusive because it's one thing that we add. So you probably will be quicker if you use a smartphone, an application on a smartphone, to, or just go there and, and push the button to close things, instead of looking at the screen, waiting for some time, entering the room, and then looking at the device, and then looking at the button, and then waiting it is lower, but if you cannot do things differently, it's, it's the only way that you have. Hmm? So then, these things was also one of the first uh, Windows uh, power, the touch screens, so you, you can also touch it, and if you connect the mouse and the keyboard, you can also use it with mouse and keyboard, but cl clearly the user interface was uh, fought for the highs or for touch. You can see the big buttons, because highs has this, um, this, this issue of not, um, so which is the issue with high, high base interaction, with gaze base interaction. So you, you have seen here that the person look at the room and then after a while, so he, there is here but it's not very visible, after looks at button and after a while you go in the kitchen. Why after a while? What's the problem with eyes as an input method? Because you, exactly, because you cannot distinguish when you're looking for reading, for whatever, and when you're looking because you want to click something, because you just look. And so this is called the Mida touch problem, like Mida, the, the king of the, of the history. So in that case, what King Mida did. What's the story about Mida's king? Everything the person touched becomes gold. Hmm? And then the story is longer, but this is the, the summary. And so here we have this is called the mid touch for the same reason, because everything this, the high CE can be actionable, and you need to a way to distinguish between, okay, I'm just looking around because I'm reading, or because I'm selecting the room, or I want to click something. So one way to solve this, there are a few ways to solve this. One is adding a physical control. So you look something when you want action to on something, you press a button, you press the spacebar, 
for instance. So you do some action that is unrelated with the highs. But then if you have motor problems, this is not suitable for you because you cannot press anything. And the other thing is adding a delay. Hmm? So in this case here, when you look at the button, there was um, a circular uh, progress bar. And when the progress bars were completed, then the button was clicked. And so you add delay because you have to distinguish what you are seeing and what you are uh, instead want to, to interact with. And so if you look at the button and you see this progress bar, when the progress bar, before the progress bar, progress bar is complete, you can look some, somebody, somewhere else and you can interact with other pieces of interface. And so reducing error or tolerance for errors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is more an example of inclusive design. And this was also, again, touch, you can use with keyboard, with the mouse. It's also this vocal part that was not for input, it was just for output. It tells you what happens um, vocally, in this case in Italian. Mm -hmm. And so this is more, let's say, on the inclusive design size. Um, so, and this is also a, a good example to think of a common thread that we have covered today that is why we cannot, so since focusing on a single sense, on a single ability could be problematic because we can exclude other people, why we should rely on one single sense? Why we should rely heavily on one single ability? Why we cannot use multiple senses, multiple abilities at the same time? So like the eye tracker application did, if you don't want to use eye tracker, you cannot use eye tracker, you can use touch. You can use mouse, you can use keyboard, and the same application will react in all these cases. Hmm? And again, you can provide different input out mechanism. There is voice, there was voice. It was 10 years ago, so it was speech to text was, no, sorry, text to speech was uh, one of the easy thing to, to done. The vice versa, recognizing the voice, not a lot. Um, now should be, it will be easier. So we can provide different input output mechanism in different contexts and for different people if we want, hmm? whether we rely on inclusive design or universal design, but if our goal is not excluding anybody or excluding less people as possible, this is a good way to, to do this. And we can adapt, so there's lots that is, the lab's lots is doing artificial intelligence. We can adapt the user interface according to different situation if we want. We can recognize different moments of the day, of the age, of the life in which to adapt the interface. And we can provide redundancy. An input mechanism is not working. I have another mechanism that is redundant with respect to that, that is the primary, but still allow me to operate the application. We can add compatibility with assistive technologies moving more on the accessibility side than not in general, etc. So we can, here there is an example about accessibility. Our operating system already have a series of things that you can enable, like the spoken content or the description of things, or Zoom hmm, to enable some features that are not enabled by default, but they can be useful for, for many. Uh, this is an example on a, uh, not the current version of macOS and a version of Android that has this built in. And what we can try to do is to build user interfaces that are multimodal. Hmm? So multimodal interfaces are interfaces that use more than one sensory channel or mode of interaction together in a redundant way, maybe. Hmm? So we already had this conversation a few weeks ago. So if you remember, um, Vision is the sensory channel, and gaze is the mode of interaction, because we 
look at things. And with eye trackers, we, we control that. Uh, taste and voice test. Taste will be the sensory channel, and voice is the mode of interaction. We can speak. Hmm? Uh, there is not a lot of computing software, computer computing interface, interactive system that use taste as a output modality, but there are some things in your search that use taste, but it's very, very preliminary, very, very research. A touch gesture, one is understanding, the other is interacting. Hearing, we have a mode of interaction with hearing, it's just a sensory, and smell. Hmm? So, can we use all of these in the user interface? Yes, no. Not, no, not, not currently, at least. Maybe in 20 years, we can have a different discussion, but currently we can't, we cannot. Uh, there are things, so we, we, pre we, we predominantly use vision. We, use we can use gaze with eye trackers or something like that. We can use voice. We surely can use hearing for the sounds that the system does or for things like Alexa that speaks. Hmm? Uh, we use surely gesture that it could be gesture on a screen or gesture in a 3D environment. Um, we don't use a lot of touch like understanding if uh, um, something as a certain shape, or it's cold, or it's hot. That sense, we are not using that a lot. It is possible. There are some experiment with um, making the, the something, some device hotter or colder, and according to the situation, you can do something. Mm -hmm. um, there is also something about taste, and there is quite a, a lot of things, actually. Well, not a lot. Uh, some things about smell. How can you smell with a user interface as a sensory channel, clearly, not to give inputs? Smell. The computer produces a perfume, basically. Smell. In which context? you can imagine that smell, for doing what you can imagine that smell could be? Choosing? Yeah, that is for doing the things that you want to do already. For, without choosing, a, without, not, without, for not for buying something that has a smell, but in, imagine in a car. This was actually done in research, not in, in car. Well, there is some cars that has something similar, not, not identical, but imagine a car. What you can do with smell in a car? What the car can, can do, communicate to you with smell? Yes, this is the, the current car I already do since forever, but let's imagine something that current car doesn't do. It's not working properly. So yes, for instance, you can use, there was a study a few years ago of using smell to notify people. So if something is not working, I produce a, a smell of danger, so notification. Instead of seeing a danger notification, you see, you, um, you smell something dangerous. You smell a bad, um, a bad perfume, a bad, uh, instead if it's something positive, or a warning, a message received. So they, they use a few smells to um, identify notification, basically give notification, and it works. It worked quite well. Uh, and it was less intrusive than showing um, the same notification on the display of the car. Because you already have so, so many things to look in, in the car, so while you're driving with the rain, etc. So that was a more, a less intrusive way to uh, use smell hmm? to, to give a simple notification, clearly. Two, three types of notification, not, not a lot of things. But dangers, you smell something and you stop the car, first of all, hmm? avoiding bigger trouble. And this, again, worked uh, quite, a, quite well. They're using, yes, the same principle used with the gas. Yes, 
in, in, in all kitchens. The same idea, hmm? then in that case is, is, is embedded in the, no, in, no. The, gas the, the natural gas doesn't have, they treated it before putting your, bringing the home. Yes, it's the same idea. This is made on purpose on interactive technology that decide which smell, but the, the principle is the same, yes, exactly. And so using that to recognize that something is not working. Yes, and this is about, more about test, test uh, sorry, no, 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 touching, not, test, not testing. Um, yes, but touching, yes. Patterns in which you recognize something. Again, this is not interactive, right, because it was just in the cover and it will remain the same forever, like in the, in the gas situation. But yes, that is a way to use other senses. That we have, it's not that we have to, to enable them, we just have those senses. And, and so we currently, are using, for computing system, a lot of vision, some gestures, a little of hearing, a very, very little voice, nothing on the other side, currently, in our interactive system, in general, hmm, that we have. Interactive compute, computerized system. Hmm? And again, there are some work on smell. A few work on taste, but taste is much more difficult because you need to to put something in your mouth to, to use it, so it's not really uh, smell it is in the environment, so in close environment, it, it may work easier than, um, than eating something to, to understand, to interact with the system or to get feedback from a system. Um, okay, so why multimodality? Not just for the sake of doing, not just for enclosing, but also because, yes, for, for inclusing and universal design because multiple modes actually increase what's called the bandwidth of the interaction. Mm -hmm. So it's that redundancy that we said before. If you cannot use it, you can use another methodology. It can complement an actual output modality. So if you are distracted and you don't see something, you may be hear something. So it's providing the same information twice. Or again, you cannot hear, but you see something. So it's increasing the bandwidth of interaction, adding information, adding in, presenting the same information in multiple ways. Because again, we use a lot of the visual channel and the visual channel is easy to be overloaded with too many information in an environment. So adding other channels can help reducing the overload of the visual channel. And, and well, here there are two very, very simple examples of multimodal interfaces. One is Alexa, the, uh, sorry, the Amazon Echo, hmm, that has clearly a vision part. You have to look at this thing. Uh, there is gesture because it's multi-touch or it's touch. Uh, there is earring because it speaks, and there's also speech because you can interact with it in different parts of the interface. And here there is, for instance, a Siri on, uh, on a Mac, in which you just have vision, hearing, speech, you don't have gestures. Not, not multi-touch, at least gesture, okay? So these are already sort of multimodal information, which you ask, which is the waiter today, and Alexa can say today is 13 degrees, and it's clear, and you can also see this, you hear this, and you can tap here to get more information. So, but even without tapping, it's at least two uh, interaction way. One is seeing and reading the information, the other hearing the same information twice. Okay, just to conclude, here there is, uh, we already mentioned this last, two, last week. Um, and this is strictly connected with what we, we cover, that is accessibility. So let's start from one consideration, that is that the web, the current web is not accessible. It's largely not accessible. Even if 
the guidelines for accessibility exist since forever, basically. Hmm? So if you look in the, the scientific literature, you find papers of 10, 15, 20 years ago saying the web is not accessible. And if you write the same paper now, you will find that the web is still not accessible for a large part. Um, and being not accessible means also that you don't, you're excluding people. Hmm? So if you are creating a web application and not making it accessible, you are excluding people. And accessibility is not something you have to think about, it's just, again, in this case, checkbox, you have standards, you can verify those. And accessibility, like the standards, we have mentioned this one, the WCAG, that is the Web Content Accessibility Guideline, but there exists other accessibility guideline for the user agent, for instance, for browsers, for authoring tools, for JavaScript interactive application on the web, not just content, that is the WCAG, uh, but also for interactive JavaScript-based application. These are all guidelines that are all standard, and some of them, like the WCAG, are adopted in the law of the countries. It's not just, oh, there is a standard there if you want to look it. Hmm? So for instance, in Italy, there is this Stanka Act from the name of the person that uh, write that, uh, that is promoting the accessibility of information technology and that should be mandatory for all the public administrations, website, and notice that users should be mandatory because it is, but in practice it's not. And that's, that law directly mentioned the WCAG guidelines that we have covered briefly a few times ago. So all the website of public administration should follow that guideline, should be fully accessible according to the guidelines. And again, it's not, most of them are quite easy. And if you remember, we, we have seen some of them, like the alternative text for images and for videos, caption for videos should be, if there is a video, should be caption, multimodality, should be a way, different way to use that same video to, to see, to get the content from the same video. Hmm? With captions, for instance, with textual description, with an audio description, with some kind of descriptions, hmm? serving different population. And we have already, uh, uh, at a glimpse of this, so I, I will not go into, into a lot of details, but essentially the WCAG has a split in principal guidelines levels, where the principal are the principles that are connected with the guidelines, so the first principle is perceivable, and then there are the guidelines that satisfy that principle, and these are the ones that we, we use for checking, automatically or not, a web application, and then there are levels. Level A is the least constrained level, so the easiest one to satisfy, and level AAA is the hardest one to satisfy. And for some guidelines, they're just the one level because it's provide text alternative. That is, you don't have levels of complexity. You have to provide text alternatives to fulfill the guidelines. And for others, it depends what you want to do. Hmm? There are simpler, moder moderate, or complex way to solve, to satisfy the guidelines. And the, the WCG 2.0, uh, that is the current version, 2.1 actually is the current version, also tell you which is the target that you want to, that you should follow um, to co accomplish the guidelines. So maybe it's say, okay, the target for this one is level AA. And so you, if you want, you can do triple A, but double A is, is fine hmm? for covering 90% of the accessibility users or 95%. So they target at least this hmm? or at least the level A, but it gives you degrees of application. Hmm? And so in some cases, in some cases like for contrast, solving, having all the website with level triple A is very, very hard because it's a really different contrast of color for every single element. So for contrast, there is distinction. Double uh, A is, is enough. Then if you can do triple A, it's better. But double A is, is enough. So 
because again, AAA is more or less the contrast, a little bit less than the contrast here between black and white. So it's a huge contrast. Not just that, but is on that range uh, of level of contrast. So you have, this is a way in which that guidelines is, is done. So if you are doing web applications in general in the future, whatever you will do after, please don't forget. I'll let me do this uh, advertisement before leaving. Don't forget that exist, well, don't forget that exist people, that is uh, the, the key uh, motivation of the entire course, but specifically, don't forget that exist guidelines and that you have tools to automatically check guidelines for the web, at least. And so if you're developing in the future web application or website, don't contribute to make the web less accessible. Contribute to make the web more accessible. And with that, we can conclude the lecture. And I was saying tomorrow you will start speaking with Albert again, not with me, about uh, heuristic evaluation that will be part of assignment five that we have almost ready and we would really like to publish this week so that you can still, we can already look at what is requested for the heuristic evaluation of your prototypes, okay? If you have any question, I'm still here for 10 minutes. Otherwise, have a nice week.